If I say that a movie has good cinematography, what does that make you think of? Pretty sunsets? One-shot sequences? Steady cams? Cranes? Color? None of those are bad answers, and I don't think there's necessarily a wrong answer to the question of what makes cinematography good. But when we talk about good cinematography, I feel like we're not actually talking about good cinematography. We're talking about what we notice, about what's loud and what's showy. Now here's the thing. Showy is not always good, and good is not always showy. So let's talk about quiet cinematography. The film today is Floating Weeds by Yasuhiro Ozu, and it's one that I highly recommend. If you're unfamiliar with Ozu, then the only thing you need to know is that his style was, and still is, a very distinct one. Like all the great directors, you'll know within about five seconds that you're watching one of Ozu's films. A lot's been written about him, and I don't pretend to be any kind of expert, but I do want to talk about three specific things that his camera is doing. Three things that I don't think many other directors have a good handle on these days. Depth, pillow shots, and composition. But before we go any further, I have an assignment for you. For the rest of this video, I want you to count how many shots you think would work on their own as gorgeous still photos. You think you can do that? Good. How do you give a shot texture? How do you make it feel alive? One of the things that I like so much about Ozu is that the space inside his shots feels completely natural and real, not like it's shot on a soundstage somewhere. And I think a lot of that texture comes from the depth he achieves. Let's take a look at this shot. The first thing to take note of is the use of deep focus. Notice just how established and active the background, middle ground, and foreground are. Uh, Ozu preferred a very neutral, flat, realistic lens. He didn't like lenses that distorted or emphasized any part of the frame uh, in favor over any other part of the frame. He wanted the whole frame to be in focus from front to back, more or less anyway, uh, as a record rather than the lens getting into the act with its own distorting point of view. But this kind of depth isn't just built by deep focus. A lot of it's in the staging. In a shot like this, the characters aren't mushed together in the center of the frame. They're allowed to occupy not only every bit of the frame, but every bit outside the frame. We'll come back to this, but do you see how characters are cut off? None of this is done to make the shot seem busy or to confuse your eyes from where to concentrate, but to give it that sense of space. Look at the props in these next few shots. You don't think about it when you're watching, but they're doing quite a lot of work. Whether it's a lantern, or a sake bottle, or a bicycle, or just posters on the wall, they're all giving the shot that very real, very subtle, very lived-in quality. For the majority of his career, Ozu almost exclusively alternated between three shots. Wides, close-ups, which really aren't that close, and these. These are what Roger Ebert called pillow shots, based on pillow words from Japanese poetry. At least I think it was Roger Ebert. Might not have been. Doesn't matter. They'll talk and there'll be some interaction, and then a certain phrase will end, and he'll cut outside, and he'll show something. A window and a roof line, or um, a tree and a street, and he'll hold on that and then he'll come back inside. It's a, he's using it as punctuation. It's a form of silence. It's a form of saying, let's not rush headlong from each scene to the next scene, but let's say, okay, this has happened. Now we'll kind of look out the window and think about it. And now this has happened. And now we'll take another moment. And that use of the pillow shot gives his films a kind of thoughtfulness and pacing that uh, becomes really important to you after a while. You begin to appreciate it. The idea of pillow shots isn't something non-existent in today's films, but when they do pop up, they tend to just be nature porn. I'm not saying these are useless or that I don't enjoy them, but I do feel like they're often just there to be pretty. Here, Ozu will often show us locations we've already seen, albeit now empty. There's probably no real significance or meaningful symbolism to these shots, but how often do you see this nowadays? I don't know, maybe it's just me, but I wish we saw more of this today. Okay, so you've been counting this whole time, right? How many shots are you up to? Well, you should be up to about 75. Ozu has a ridiculously good eye for gorgeous composition. It's often said that he would deliberately screw up the continuity from one shot to the next just to make the image more attractive. Do you see the statue of Buddha in the lower right-hand corner? As soon as the actors finish their performance and close the curtains, it moves position. Why? Well, it looks good here, 
and it looks good there. Do you really need another reason? Move a prop for better shot? Go for it. Break the 180 line? Who cares? There are no shots in an Ozu film that are only in order to further the story or to provide information. Every shot should have an intrinsic artistic interest. Take any one of his wides and you'll see that they're often framed in a very similar way. They're always floor to ceiling, they're shot from a low stance, and if you look closely, there's often a frame inside of the frame. What's also important, and I was hinting at this before, is what Ozu's camera doesn't do. Multiple times throughout the movie, he'll photograph his characters from behind, or he'll have them obscured by a wall, or a window, or the frame of the screen itself. It's almost as though he's sitting the camera down and letting whatever happens inside the frame happen on its own. This is an unobtrusive, very observant style of shooting. There are no insert shots, no extreme close-ups, and the camera never goes anywhere or sees anything that the characters themselves couldn't. Now you may look at these three things and shrug your shoulders and say whatever. And that's fine. These aren't necessarily the tools to making a great looking film. But there's more than one way to slice the cinematography cake. And there's a major misunderstanding if you or I or an Oscar winner thinks that good cinematography is all about camera movement. It's not. If it is, then Floating Weeds breaks every single rule. Because, and you probably noticed it, there isn't a single shot in this movie where the camera moves. I'm not saying that this is the best that's out there. But what I am saying is that when you take the time and build every aspect of a shot, from the background to the foreground, from what's in the shot to what's out of the shot, from the color to the depth and to the texture, you get something like this. Freeze frame that and hang it on your wall. That's cinema right there.